greenhouse gas applicability examples. In this next presentation, we will apply the greenhouse gas applicability tests to a number of the examples. To a number of examples. The first example is the one that we presented in the November 2010 guidance. An existing stationary source is major for PSD for another pollutant. The owner is about to undertake a modification involving greenhouse gas emission sources. It may be a major modification and subject to PSD. The proposed modification consists of a physical modification of an existing unit, that's unit one, and the addition of a new emissions unit, uh, otherwise known as mission uh, unit two. Because we will be examining netting over the contemporaneous period, it is also relevant to know that emissions unit A was added three years ago and no other contemporaneous emission increases or decreases occurred. Because unit one is being modified, the first step is to determine the baseline actual emissions for that unit. Because this is not a electric generating unit, or EGU, we look back over 10 years of emissions history. Obviously, um, as we noted in an earlier training module, if, if it was an EGU, we would look back only five years. So the applicant can choose any 24 consecutive months to represent their baseline. For simplicity, we will look only at calendar years and pick out two consecutive years. In this case, the two Two years with the highest average emissions of CO2e are years three and four. So the applicant chooses years three and four to represent the baseline actual emissions for unit one. The baseline actual emissions are the average of the two years. The average figures are shown here. Because we will be applying both the mass-based and the CO2e-based tests, we will need to keep track of both metrics at this point. Note that this particular unit only emits two of the greenhouse gases, that is CO2 and methane. So the four other greenhouse gas pollutants are not going to be discussed here. The next step is to determine the future actual emissions of Unit 1. In this example, the applicant has forecast that the unit's emissions will change as a result of the modification and that the future emissions will be 450 tons per year of CO2 and 10 tons per year of methane. By comparing the baseline actual emissions to the future actual emissions, we see that Unit 1 will have a CO2 increase of 50 tons per year and a decrease of 90 tons per year of methane. Next, we will take the change in emissions of CO2 and methane into the assessment of total greenhouse gases. Here we examine the mass base sum. So the baseline mass, the baseline mass base sum is 50, I'm sorry, 500 tons per year, which is uh, 400 tons per year of CO2 plus 100 tons per year of methane. The future actual mass base sum is 460 tons per year, which is derived from 450 tons per year of CO2 plus 10 tons per year of methane. So the difference is a decrease in 40 tons per year on a mass basis for the modified unit. Now we will do a summation of um, the carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. Now the math is similar, but in this case we multiply the methane tons by the global warming potential for methane, which is 21. The higher methane in the baseline emissions, um, with higher methane in the baseline emissions, the baseline CO2e is much greater. We have now 2,500 tons per year as CO2e in the baseline and 660 tons per year as CO2e in the future for a decrease of 1,840 tons per year on a CO2e basis. Now we turn our attention to the new unit 2. As a new unit, its baseline is zero, so we need only determine its, its future emissions. For a new unit, this would be its potential to emit, which can take into account, <coughs> account any federally enforceable limits. Note that this unit only emits one of the greenhouse gas pollutants, that's CO2, 
In this example, the future emissions of this new unit are 77,000 tons per year of greenhouse, gas emissions, of greenhouse gases. The mass-based total of greenhouse gases and the CO2E-based total are the same when only CO2 is at issue, since the global warming potential for CO2 is 1. Lastly, we need to consider the impact on emissions in the contemporaneous period of the addition of Unit A three years ago. It has emissions of 10,000 tons per year of CO2. It is important to identify and quantify the impact of any and all contemporaneous increases and decreases. In this example, this is the only one that we have to consider. Now we are ready to examine the overall emissions increase associated with the project and we will apply all four tests for modified sources. Remember, these four tests can be done in any logical order, depending on the specific data available in each case. In the first test, we will determine if the project alone represents a significant increase in greenhouse gas emissions, emissions on a mass basis. We will only consider units with emission increases of greenhouse gases that are part of the modification in this step. So we, here we have Unit 2, which has a 77,000 tons per year mass um, emissions increase of greenhouse gases. So that would count. Unit 1 has a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions and is therefore not considered in this step, Step 1. Therefore, we show an increase of 77,000 tons per year of greenhouse gas emissions on a mass basis for the project. Because this increase is greater than zero tons per year, which is the greenhouse gas significant emissions rate, the project is not yet excluded from PSD in this step of the analysis. So now we will go on to conduct the contemporaneous netting of the mass-based emissions. In this step, the credible emission increases and decreases of greenhouse gases from the project and all other contemporaneous incredible emissions increases and decreases of greenhouse gases are summed on a mass basis. It is at this point that we consider the decrease in emissions of Unit 1 and the emissions impact of the installation of Unit A three years ago. The net emissions increase on a mass basis includes a 77,000 tons per year increase for Unit 2, a 40 tons per year decrease for Unit 1, and a 10 ton per year increase for Unit A. For a total increase of 86,960 tons per year greenhouse gases on a mass basis. Because this net emissions increase is greater than zero tons per year, one carries out the same steps using the CO2E. As before, in this step, we only consider units that are affected by the project that have CO2E emission increases. So here we have Unit 2, which has a 77,000 ton per year CO2 emissions increase, so it would count. Unit 1 has a 1,840 ton per year CO2 emissions decrease, which would not count in this step. So the total of the increases are 77,000 tons per year CO2E um, as an emissions increase from Unit 2. Because this is equal to or greater than the 75,000 ton per year CO2E threshold, the modification is emitting GHGs in the amount that would make it subject to regulation. And the project is still not excluded from PSD. Um, we will need to now go on to conduct the contemporaneous netting for um, CO2E. In this step, the increases and decreases of CO2E from the proposed project and all other contemporaneous incredible emission increases and decreases of CO2E are summed. So here, the net emissions increase on a CO2E basis equals 77,000 tons per year from Unit 2, minus the 1,840 tons per year CO2E from Unit 1, plus the 10,000 tons per year of CO2E for Unit A. So summing this together, the net emissions increase is 85,160 tons per year CO2E. This emissions increase is equal to or greater than 75,000 tons per year CO2E. So because the modification is both a significant emissions increase and a significant net emissions increase on both the mass and CO2 
E uh, bases. The modification, as proposed, is subject to PSD for greenhouse gases. Now, as we noted before, there are um, opportunities where an applicant, um, if they think that they're going to trigger PSD, um, may want to consider alternatives in order to avoid PSD. So if the applicant wishes to illegally avoid PSD for this project, for the proposed project, there are a number of steps that can be taken. The applicant can take enforceable limits to reduce the net emissions increase below the threshold in any one of the four tests. In this instance, the simplest approach would be to agree to take a limit on Unit 2, um, on Unit 2 CO2e that would be below the 75,000 tons per year. In this instance, the project increase would be less than 75,000 tons per year CO2e, and, and the contemporaneous increases and decreases would then, therefore, not need to be considered. So now we're going to go into more specific examples, um, uh, and because landfills represent a unique set of circumstances for evaluating greenhouse gases, we, uh, we have in this section um, three different examples for um, GHG applicability determinations for landfills. All right, in our first example, uh, we have a company X1, which is planning to construct an construct an entirely new municipal solid waste landfill um, in 2012 with a capacity of 2.2 um, million megagrams. This landfill will be la located in an attainment area for all regulated NSR pollutants. The lifespan of landfill A is expected to be 30 years. The first step is to determine the potential to emit for the landfill. We will assume in this example that the waste is delivered to the landfill on an even basis over the 30 years for an average waste acceptance rate of 73,333 megagrams per year. The peak emissions will occur in the year after the closure of the landfill. <clears throat> in this case, the peak emissions will occur in the year of 2042, which is essentially 2012 plus 30 years out. For landfills without collection and control systems, greenhouse gases and non-methane organic compounds, NMOT, or VOCs, are the main concerns, emissions of concern under the PSC program. Landfill emissions um, can be modeled under a, um, a uh, software program called LANGEM, which will determine the emissions for that peak year. The key pollutants, again, associated with the landfill are methane, CO2, and NMOC. So what is LANGEM? Um, it, it can be used to calculate um, methane, CO2e, and NMOC emissions from landfills to determine the potential to emit. It is an Excel spreadsheet that is developed by EPA for analyzing emissions from municipal solid waste landfills. And it can be provided, it can be found at um, the website listed at the bottom of this slide. In this example, um, we will apply both the mass based and CO2E based tests. But you will see that the order is not important for this example. Um, so, first, we will look at CO2E. The potential to emit of the new landfill on a CO2E basis is, is determined as follows. The CO2E emissions are the sum of the methane generation multiplied by 21 plus the CO2 generation. We get a potential to emit in the year of maximum emissions of 89,468 tons per year of CO2E. Okay, now we will look at the potential to emit on a mass basis. The potential to emit uh, will equal the sum of the methane and the CO2E emissions. Um, and as you see, see from the math here, the sum is 14,104 tons per year on a mass basis. We also need to consider whether PSD applies to both the MSW landfill emissions, that is the NMOC, and the VOCs, which is a subset of NMOCs. Assuming that 100% of the NMOC emissions are VOC emissions, then the potential to emit for both NMOCs and VOCs is 24 tons per year.
Okay, now we're in a position to determine whether this new landfill will trigger PSD. Um, and here we show the emissions that we just came up with, and, and we compare these emissions to the new source um, applicable thresholds. Okay, so the construction of this landfill is not subject to PST because the potential to emit for greenhouse gas is less than one of the two greenhouse gas thresholds. In particular, the CO2E potential to emit is less than the PSD subject to regulation threshold, threshold of 100,000 tons per year. And also, um, it's not subject to PSD because the potential to emit of NMOCs and VOCs is less than the major source threshold of 250 tons per year. Okay, here we have a second example. Ex Company X2 is planning to construct an entirely new municipal solid waste landfill, we are calling this landfill B, in 2012 with a capacity of 2.7 million megagrams. Um, this landfill will be located in an attainment area for all regulated NSR pollutants. And again, the lifespan, lifespan of this landfill is expected to be 30 years. We will determine, <coughs> excuse me, determine the potential to emit of the new landfill, assuming a waste acceptance rate which is evenly distributed over the 30-year lifetime. The resulting waste acceptance rate in this case is 90,000 tons per year or megagrams per year. The peak emissions will occur in the year after the closure of the landfill, which is 2042. For landfills without collection and control systems, greenhouse gases and NMOC are the main emission concerns under the PSD program. So in this case, the land gem results for 2042 are for methane. 4,625 tons per year, for CO2, 12,689 tons per year, and NMOC um, compounds uh, would result in emissions of 30 tons per year. Okay, first we will determine the potential to emit in terms of CO2E, which we can compare to the subject to regulation threshold of 100,000 tons per year. So the potential to emit is the sum of the methane emissions times the global warming potential for methane, which is 21, plus the CO2 emissions. So in this case, showing the math on the slide, we come up with uh, the potential to emit of CO2E being 109,814 tons per year. Next, we will examine the greenhouse gas emissions on a mass basis. Showing the math on the slide here, um, we come up with a sum of 17,314 tons per year. We also need to consider whether PSD applies to both municipal solid waste landfill emissions, that is NMOCs, and VOCs, which is a subject which would be a subset of the NMOCs. Like we did before, assuming that 100% of the NMOC emissions are VOC emissions, then the potential to emit for both NMOCs and VOCs is 30 tons per year. Okay, in this slide, um, again, we're ready to compare the emissions to the applicable um, thresholds, both major source thresholds and the subject to regulation thresholds, um, as well as the significant emissions rate. Um, and I'll just let the... Um, let the slide speak for itself. Okay, so because the potential to emit of greenhouse gas on a mass basis is greater than 250 tons per year, and on a CO2E basis is greater than 100,000 tons per year, landfill B is considered a PSD major source, and this construction project is subject to PSD. Now, because GSG is the only regulated NSR pollutant that exceeds PSD major source, the PSD major source threshold, and the PTE of NMOCs and VOC are both less than the significant levels, <coughs> BACT will be applied to the greenhouse gas emissions from the new landfill. However, BACT will not apply to pollutants other than greenhouse gas in this case. 
However, since the land soil emissions increase, um, land soil emissions will increase with the amount of waste in place and won't reach the maximum emissions until the year after closure, the source could voluntarily accept permit conditions to limit the potential to emit of CO2e to less than 100,000 tons per year in order to remain below the subject to regulation threshold for new sources. This would allow them to avoid PSD in this particular case. Depending on the particular aspects of the landfill, it may or may not be subject to the NSPS. If the NSPS is applicable, compliance with the NSPS will keep the actual emissions below the 100,000 tons per year CO2e threshold and could provide the basis for permit conditions to limit the PTE. Again, limiting the PTE of the new landfill in this way would keep the landfill from triggering NSR or PSD applicability for greenhouse gases. If the landfill is not subject to NS, the NSPS and still wants to avoid going through PSD, the source will have to provide, provide a method for limiting the potential to emit to less than 100,000 tons per year of CO2e. These voluntary conditions must be federally enforceable. When the appropriate limits are included in the air permit, landfill B will have a potential to emit less than the subject to regulation threshold and the construction of landfill B will not be subject to PSD. Okay, our third and final example involves the expansion of an existing landfill. Company X3 owns an existing MSW landfill with a maximum capacity of 2 million megagrams um, that was opened back in 1985. There's no landfill gas collection and control system that's installed within, within the existing landfill. The existing landfill is expected to close in 2015, and company X3 is planning to add a new municipal solid waste landfill cell in 2012 with a capacity of 3 million megagrams next to the original landfill site. The lifespan of the new landfill cell is expected to be 30 years. The landfill is, is located in an attainment area for all regulated NSR pollutants. With a modification to an existing source, the first question is to determine if the existing source is a major source under PSD. Since the existing landfill did not previously go through PSD for a non-GHG regulated NSR pollutant, we, we must now determine the potential to emit for the existing landfill. In this example, we will assume a waste acceptance rate is evenly distributed um, over the 30-year lifetime. This results in a waste acceptance rate of 66,667 megagrams per year. Our first step is to determine if the greenhouse gas emissions from the, from the existing landfill exceed the subject to regulation threshold for the existing source. For modifications to existing sources, the determination of whether a source is subject to regulation includes whether the existing source has GHG emissions that are equal to or greater than 100,000 tons per year of CO2e and um, 250 tons per year on a mass basis. Both thresholds must be exceeded for the source to be a major source for greenhouse gases. We must also determine whether it has a NMOC or VOC emissions that are at or above the major source threshold of 250 tons per year. Since the potential to emit of the existing landfill is less than the PSD subject to regulation threshold, of, um, which would be 100,000 tons per year of CO2e, and it's also less than the PSD major source threshold of 250 tons per year for both NMOC and VOC, the existing major source is not major. The, excuse me, the existing source is not major. However, the construction of the new landfill cell itself could trigger PSD applicability if the modification is major on its own. So with that context, we must determine if the new source is a major source, if the new cell is a major source. Using LandGem and the specification of the new cell, the greenhouse gas and the NMOC VOC emissions are determined in the same manner as the existing facility was evaluated. And we show these results of the LandGem runs um, in this table.
okay, working off what is shown in the table, um, in this example, the new um, landfill, the 3 million um, megagram uh, landfill cell has a potential to emit of CO2E that's greater than the PSD subject to regulation threshold and the potential to emit on a mass basis which is greater than the PSD major source threshold. Therefore, the expansion project um, is subject to PSD. The NMOC and VOC emissions, however, are less than the major source threshold and their respective significance thresholds as well. So the NMOC and VOCs are not covered by PSD review. Fact will be required for the greenhouse gas emissions only. So as discussed in example two, example, uh, company X3 could request limits in its air permit to limit the potential to emit of the new cell to less than the significant or subject to regulation threshold of 100,000 tons per year of CO2e. Alternatively, a limit could be applied to the whole site including the existing and new portions of the landfill to keep the potential to emit less than the subject to regulation threshold. In considering these commitments and limitations, the source would want to consider the applicability of the NSPS and the timing of controls to determine the appropriate limit. If the potential to emit of the expansion is kept below 100,000 tons per year on a CO2e basis, PSD would not apply to this expansion project. However, it should be noted that in the future, it is quite likely that the existing potential to emit of the landfill will exceed 100,000 tons per year, and future modifications may not need to be major in and of themselves. And this concludes the training module um, regarding the GHG applicability examples.